singing them. Here we go. Hear the call of the kingdom. Lift your eyes to the king. Let his song rise within you as a fragrant offering of how God, rich in mercy, came in Christ to redeem all who trusted his unfailing grace. King of heaven, King of heaven, sing it choir. We will answer the call, we will follow, bringing hope to the world, filled with passion, filled with power to proclaim salvation in Jesus' yeah. name. Second verse, hear the call to be children of Hear the call of the children to be children of light With the mercy of heaven, the humility of Christ Walking justly before Him, loving all that is right That the life of Christ may shine through us King of heaven, King of heaven We will the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, as you can tell, this is Baptism Sunday, and I would like to introduce to you Richard Thompson, and he has decided to follow the Lord in uh, in baptism this morning, and we celebrate with him. And this is Richard's very first time to be here at Christ Church. Richard (laughs) watches us on YouTube uh, during the week. And he decided, he felt the Lord was calling him to to follow him in baptism. And he wants to say just a little bit of something to us this morning. Thank y'all. Thank you for Scott and everybody else. Thank y'all very much. So would you reach your hands out with me as we pray over him on this day that, that, that Richard has decided to turn from the things that he chased after before and he wants to follow after Christ. And we just want to celebrate with him and pray over him. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for Richard. Lord, we thank you 
for his life. Lord, we thank you that you have brought him to this place, that he has a hunger and a desire to follow after you, Lord. We pray that you meet him in the waters of baptism this morning, Lord, that he will follow you all the days of your life. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you communicate to us through YouTube or here in person. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you extravagantly go to uh, to. to teach us and to reach us and to show us that you love us. Lord, we pray that you would watch over him and bless him this morning as we celebrate this new life. Lord, the old things are gone and the new has come and we celebrate that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I know we all lost an hour of sleep last night, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. If this is your first time at Christ Church, we just want you to know that this is a safe place for you to come as you are. We are a group of imperfect people following after Christ, the Christ who has transformed our lives, who has changed every bit of us, and we are here in response to his extravagant mercy and love and grace and hope. And we pray that you experience the love of Christ this morning that surrounds each of us, that his presence is already here. Amen? Amen. Would you read with me our opening scripture, Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you, Jesus, this morning for your presence that is among us. And thank you through these times of worship, this worth-ship, this time when we are saying that you are worthy above all. Thank you for the gift that we can come together and join our voices and give worth where it is due to you. Lord, as many of us, our hearts are still stirred by what we saw last week and seeing the response of the Christians in the Middle East (laughs) worshiping with all their might in the face of persecution. Thank you, Lord, that we, that I, meek and lowly as I am, get to join with the saints and the angels in this worship and acclaiming worth where it is due. Lord, we praise you. Above all things, help us to turn our eyes to you this morning. In your name, amen. Amen. 
as we continue in our corporate worship through song, our altar care team is going to come down to the front. And if this is your first time, we have a time of prayer every Sunday. And if there's any need that you have brought in with you this morning, you can come as you are down to this altar and offer it before the Lord and our brothers and sisters in Christ. But let's continue and sing together.
thus led by his spirit. Thus led by his spirit. This is where we're all going to fountains of love. Thank you that when this life is over, it isn't over. There's fountains and fountains of love. For eternity, that's what you have for us, love. Lord, fit us here on this earth to give love. Let us look like you, Lord. Let us love ourselves, Lord.
Revelation 12 says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Church, sing the scripture, we will overcome. take just a moment. I want us to sing that again, just a second, but we're going to have prayer for a group that are on their way to Haiti. Now, from time to time, a church sends out teams all over the world, and as we can see all the reports coming from around the world now, these teams crisscross the world, and they have impact. They have impact on the countries they go, and the countries they go have impact on them. And so we're praying that as they go to Haiti, a country that is in great need, but God has his hand on this nation, and it's under constant prayer for just, just folks all over the world that Haiti would have a, have a renewal in the spirit. They're going to do all kinds of, uh, of, of wonderful, benevolent, humanitarian things, and also there'll be prayer, and there's, there's just always spiritual need in Haiti. So I'm wondering if, if uh, some of you here just would just uh, uh, join hands with those, and we would join hands. I'll get in the center, and we'll pray you agree with me. And then we're going to sing the song again. They overcame. Amen. Lord, we thank you that we overcome with the power of our testimony. And, Lord, you've been at work in Haiti for a long time. But, Lord, it's, it's really time for the, the spiritual uh, oppression there to be broken, for, for the blessing to flow through these wonderful, beautiful people, Lord, that, in need, that are in need of you. And we pray for this team as they go to Haiti. That, Lord, that you would use them to bless the people of Haiti and you would use the people of Haiti to bless them. Anoint them with your spirit. Give them traveling mercies. Meet their needs, O oh God. 
And Lord, give them a knowledge on how to act as they're there and be used of you in a mighty way. Let the people of God shout amen. amen. Would you shout amen? Hallelujah. And the word of our testimony, everyone one through six to head upstairs to the children's worship center to continue your time of worship and learning and all of us that remain in the room please walk across the aisle share the peace of christ with someone that you don't know today and just greet them in the name of jesus online church wow what a service we're having today the presence of the lord is amazing in this room we pray that you are feeling the blessing of god come across the airways and that you are being blessed this day we bring blessings to you and we are thankful that you are here pastor jay how are you doing this morning warmer than this week, which is good, but we welcome everyone and we offer Christ peace to you. Thank you for joining us. You're all over the country this year, this week, I'm sorry. Uh, Ireland I saw, I saw uh, other places in Europe. Thank you for joining us. God bless you. That's right. We have a, a very good friend in the Philippines today and she's joined us. So we say hello to her and thankful that she had a safe trip. You all mean so much to us. We pray for you every week. We think about you every day. So if you have needs that we can pray for you, please let us know how we can serve you. Well, God bless you, and let's continue our worship. It's never easy to break up a party, but that's what happens whenever God's people get together. It's exciting. So we are glad that you all are here today. We pray that you have seen a friend or if you if you came not knowing anyone we pray that you've met a friend that you've met your section leader that we have in each section and that you've been greeted in the name of jesus well i want to welcome we welcome everybody for being with us but we particularly always want to give a word of welcome to those who are visiting with us for the very first time and you may be in the room for the first time or you may be worshiping online with us through our live stream for the first time and if you are, we just want to welcome you. We pray that today, it's our prayer every Sunday that when you come into this room or when you worship with us online, that you will encounter the presence of God and that you will be forever changed in his presence. And so we pray that you would meet a friend. If you're in the room and you're visiting with us, grab a connection card in the pew in front of you. Fill it out so we have a little bit of information to be able to greet you, to say hello. You can pass that to an usher as you exit the sanctuary, or you can take it to the hospitality center located off of the sanctuary foyer. And if you're visiting with us online, and I know we've got folks this morning joining us from Ireland and from the Philippines and from all over the world, if you're joining us on line say hello to pastor linda or pastor jay let them know you're here they're here to pray with you to greet you and to provide any resources that you need about our church well we've got several exciting things coming up in the life of our community soon and it starts this afternoon at 4 p.m we have our annual meeting 
for the church today at four in Montel Hardwick Hall, just right upstairs in the in the sec, in the building right behind where we are now. And we're going to have refreshments. We're going to have a time of sharing, a time of just friendship and community as we celebrate the great things that God has done in us last year and that he's already doing in us this year. We will approve new board members. We'll share a financial report. We will share some other. Pastor Dan will share with us as well. So you won't want to miss it. It's going to be fun at 4 p.m. this afternoon. On Friday, March 13th, the elementary age kids are having a lock-in at the church. Man, that sounds exciting and terrifying. I'm going to make sure my office is locked that night. But so if you are a child in grades 1 through 6 or you have a child in grades 1 through 6, sign up at the Kid Park Center. It's going to be fun. There's going to be a pancake breakfast. It's only $10 per child. Coming up on Palm Sunday, we just wanted to let you know that on March the 29th on Palm Sunday, we are going to have a very special guest in our Sunday morning worship service that Sunday to bless us in song. It's the Watoto Children's Choir from Africa, and they are known, yeah, you are, you are going to really enjoy them. They are known all around the world. They are wonderful, and they come ministering in Jesus' name, and they're going to be with us on Palm Sunday. So that's a great day to bring a friend and to hear this fun children's choir. Finally, on Easter Sunday, the next Sunday, we will have a fun Easter egg hunt in the atrium for all the kids. It's just a great way to bring some excitement to the kids. It's a great great thing to bring your friends and family to. So it's going to be in the atrium um, at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, April the 5th on Easter. So we need taped uh, shut eggs with candy. And you can drop them off. at a, There's going to be a collection place outside of the Kid Park Center. I also just want to thank, it's so great to always worship with all of the, our Mercy Sisters that are here with us each week. I know we've got three of you all are, are going to graduate from the program this week, and we just send you out with our blessings and our love. We love you all and we'll continue to pray for you and pray with you. This week I was reading in Mark's gospel about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And we remember that story. It's, it's one of those wonderful miracles where Jesus took something very meager and small, five loaves of bread and two fish, and he made a meal for 5,000. And what was, what was remarkable to me was just a few verses after the story Mark records, he said, and the disciples, they still didn't understand the miracle of what had happened. And I was reflecting on what was the miracle of what had happened. And I believe that the miracle of what had happened is that when when a few people put some very, very meager resources into Jesus's hands, and when he took them up and when he blessed those resources and broke them, and when he sent them out, there was enough. And not only enough, there was abundance. After they had fed the 5,000, they picked up 12 extra baskets full of food. And so this is the invitation that we have. We have the invitation to put into Jesus' hands our resources, meager and small as they are. They look like they're not enough. They look like they're not even enough for us sometimes, let alone enough to serve the Lord or bless the world. But when we put them in Jesus' hands and he blesses them and breaks them and sends them out, they become abundance, abundance. So we can trust. We can trust the one whose hands we place them in the one who takes what is small and makes it great, the one who takes what is scarce and makes it full. So would you pray with me over our offering? Father, we come to this time of our service to worship you through giving you what you have given to us. And so we place our meager resources into your hands just like they placed the five loaves and the two fish into your hands so many centuries ago. And we pray that you would do the same thing with our resources, that you would bless them, that you would break them, that you would send them out into the community and around the world, and that miraculously, through your grace, they would be enough, and not only enough, but they would be abundance. 
We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will God bless you as you worship through your tithes and offerings.
the sun God's ever done anything in your life, would you raise your hand and just say, Praise God, 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 praise God. scripture we want to thank God for uh, Amanda and Christopher had a baby her name is Francine Claire and she's had a little bit of birth trauma and uh, uh, Jackie Stanfield's husband Bob had a bad fall Friday night and he's broken lots of ribs and, and uh, a lot of pain. And I went to see him yesterday evening. And, and he, I thought he was unconscious. He was just laying there and he opened his eyes and he just looked at me like, oh, Dan. He's like, how's our little baby girl doing? <laughs> I'm like, she's okay, Bob. Okay then. And he goes back to sleep. <laughs> so it tells you what's on people's mind. Isn't it wonderful? So we give glory to God, and you know, we, we may not be the most perfect community, but we're a community, we're a family in God, and we thank the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. Please read with me the word of the Lord, Ephesians chapter 2, verses uh, 1 through 10. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclination of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everybody else. But God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness toward us as shown in all He has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by His grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Well, you're here. I am supposing you are ready for spring. Me too. So we have had our fill of wintry blasts this year. And by God's grace, perhaps that is all uh, behind us now. I want to talk to you about this passage. I'm going to call this the crafted life. A few years ago, I read a statement by C.S. Lewis in one of his uh, books on uh, English literature. And he made, he made a comment that has stuck with me since, and I thought it would be good to share with you this morning. Lewis says that the difference between an amateur and a professional 
is that an amateur believes that a raw product is a finished product. A professional, on the other hand, learns to craft a raw product into a finished product. Now, we've all experienced what Lewis means, and let me unpack that just for a moment. I think it will help us to understand this passage. Most of us know some great cook that's never received any kind of professional culinary training, uh, and most of us know a great singer or guitarist or pianist that has learned uh, music entirely on his or her own. There are many amateurs in the world like that with enormous talent. Some of them become quite famous for their talent. But most of the time, amateurs uh, perform as a hobby. It's rare for an amateur to rely on his or her talent as a way of making a living. Um, take a, the amateur musician, for example, uh, uh, usually has to support herself doing something different than what she would most like to do. And as we are in Nashville, we, we, are, you know, we are surrounded with examples of, of that, uh, of people that in their hometown were just so outstanding in their talent. Someone says, you've got to go to Nashville, you've got to go to New York, you've got to go to Hollywood, somewhere where the arts is, and, and, and they are, you're making it, and if you do. But in today's reading, the Apostle Paul spends most of his passage talking about the grace of God. He reminds us, as he does in many of his passages, that human beings do not have a natural capacity to craft a life that is pleasing to God. There are no raw products for a healthy spiritual life, one might say. And that's the great uh, rediscovery that the Protestant reformers made. The Protestant reformers thought it was necessary to remind the church of their day that uh, to come back to the New Testament teachings uh, on the doctrines of grace. Many people at the time of the Reformation seemed to believe that their own works could save them, that their efforts at moral transformation could result, uh, could, could produce a holy life. But the Protestant reformers recovered this important truth that we've read today in the words of St. Paul and are, are elsewhere in his writings that sinners are dead and trespasses and sin and cannot, cannot help themselves. They have no power to save themselves. But the reformer's emphasis on grace as the unmerited favor of God has gradually, I think, obscured another equally important New Testament uh, truth. And that is that grace is also the enabling power of God. It is the power of God that makes the gift of God's favor so valuable. It brings a new ability into the world and into our lives that we didn't have before. And that power must be accepted. That's why we make a profession of faith in Christ. But then that, that power must be applied to life, which is the work of sanctification. The Apostle, Paul, the Apostle James points this out in his small letter. James reminds us that God's grace evokes a response. It demands a response. Saying yes to God's grace implies we are ready to cooperate with God's grace. In fact, the Apostle James uses the Greek word synerge to express the kind of response that we're, ki we're called to make. I don't think I need to, uh, to uh, even translate that because synerge, as it sounds, is so connected to the English word synergy. And the Latin uh, translation of that word is cooperator, which I also I don't think need to translate because that's so connected to the English word cooperate. The implications of the epistle of James is that we're supposed to respond to God's power and presence in a way that our active responses to grace produces a different quality of life. And that, I think, is what the Apostle Paul has in mind as he concludes this passage we've read today, that our transformation will result in good works. In other words, grace is the spiritual raw product, which God intends us to craft into a life well lived, a life of joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Now, the best example of this is the service of Holy Communion. The bread and wine that we bring to the Lord's table is, are not materially different than the bread and the wine that human beings have been consuming at their own tables uh, ever since civilization began. Throughout his, uh, Christian history, people brought bread and wine from their own homes that they have made for the celebration of communion. 
the elements of communion were the products of their own hands. They didn't bring uh, grapes and wheat uh, to the church. Uh, they brought the products that they had fashioned from the bread and the wheats. And that's the background for the old prayer that I often use. We thank you, Lord God, King of the universe, for this bread and this wine which you have created and human hands have prepared and shall be for us the body and blood of Christ. Early Christians adopted that prayer from a similar one that you can hear in any Jewish Passover. If you've ever been a say, to a Seder, you've heard similar words to this. But I'd like for you to notice the spiritual assumptions of this prayer. Number one, God creates things. Secondly, human beings fashion things out of that which God creates. Third, human beings offer the products of their hands back to God. And four, God receives this gift of human hands, blesses it, and gives it back to human beings again for, as agents of their transformation. That's why we often hear the one that presides at the table say, the gifts of God for the people of God. The gifts of God, the gifts of the people to God become the gifts of God to the people. And it is the cycle of transformation power that gradually molds a people into something very different than what any other sort of human society is capable of doing. Now, this principle of communion as a model for transformation life is at the heart of all Christian teaching and practice. God creates and he offers us gifts both material and spiritual gifts. If you ate this morning, God created the stuff that you ate. Though, and some of the things that we're eating that comes in packages, that's debatable whether God ever saw that. But that's another, another uh, subject altogether. But God gives us things to eat. God gives us God gives us air. Uh, God gives us the materials from which we fashion things, we build things. But we have to decide whether or not to accept God's gifts. You can live out under a tree if you like, but even the tree is God, so get out from under the shade, you know? But we have to decide what to do with God's gifts once we accept them. Now, a prime example of this is tithing. That's an example of how this works. God provides material resources, and ask us to give some of them back. And he promises to transform what we give back to him into adequate provision, into something that will meet our needs, and to take this gift of our will and, and sometimes our reluctant will, but nonetheless, we give these gifts back. God promises to take this, not only the material gift, but the intention of it, and to transform our lives, and he will meet all of our needs. He promises to do this. When we give to the Lord, he gives us more to give, so to speak. Tithing is a sacramental action. That's what I'm saying. Just like the bread and the wine. God gives us things. We give some of it back. God gives it back to us. And spiritual gifts operate by that same principle. If God's given you a spiritual gift, it must be developed. Two weeks ago, we read a passage where Paul reminds us that we have received a foundation and we're supposed to build something on this foundation. And what we build, Paul said, it might be gold, silver, uh, gold, uh, silver, or precious stones, or it might be wood, hay, and stubble, something that the first crisis will destroy. But whatever we build on this foundation, which is the gospel, depends on the amount of attention we give to the work and also to the materials we use in the construction of our spiritual house. And yet another place, the Apostle Paul tells us we are living epistles, read and known by everyone we meet. That means we're supposed to become living, breathing Bibles. That doesn't mean we've got to go around quoting the Bible all the time. Many of the people quoting the Bible never live the Bible. It means we're supposed to grow until our lives reflect the goodness of God into such a way that our lives become the embodied words of God, visible for all to see. You've probably hold that, heard that old cliche somewhere, uh, you may be the only Bible that someone ever reads. And, and uh, like a lot of cliches, it contains a lot of truth. In fact, it's nearly a paraphrase of what Paul is writing to us. But the question is, how do we go about crafting our lives? How do we build on this foundation? And how do we become living epistles? 
How do we move from a joyful acceptance of God's mercy and power into a lifestyle that is a continual synergistic cooperation with grace and which produces a brand new kind of life that startles the world uh, with with an example of God's uh, power and, and beauty? A few weeks ago, somebody told me this story I wanted to share with you from their 12-step group. I don't mean he told me one of the stories of the 12-step group because some of you will be heading the doors saying like, oh no, here it all comes out. We know those of us that have been to 12-step group, and my hand's in the air, I was in one for three years, uh, every week, faithfully, uh, and, uh, and we know that what is said in group stays in group. Lots of you have been there too. Yeah, so come on up. Just come out of the shadows, you know. Um, well, what's in, it's in, uh, they, they, they take that to Vegas, but what's done in Vegas ought to be told, actually. Uh, in fact, if you go to Vegas, just go ahead and sign up for a 12-step group. You, you need one. That's, um, uh, there might be a place closer to hell and the earth, but I don't know where it would be. All right. Uh, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, now I'll get letters and cards and Chamber of Commerce and Las Vegas and all that. Oh, help me, Lord. So that's why people say, you know, why do you, you know, why do you write so much notes? Are you kidding? If I didn't make notes, this is the kind of stuff that comes out, and I get in all kind of trouble. <laughs> so, you know, the notes has tried to keep me safe. It's like training wheels, you know. If you, if you don't have the training wheels, you have a bad wreck and hurt yourself. But anyway, what the man said in this group that wasn't about his own story, he said, in the first step, the first step of the 12 steps is to admit our, powerless, our powerlessness over some habit or chemical in our lives, right? Something else has been calling the shots in our lives, and we have to take our first step because we've tried and tried, and we failed and failed, and we've become tired of being sick and tired, right? Okay, so... So we have to admit that we've run out of gas, and we can't do it anymore. And we, we, we have to admit that we are doomed to keep repeating our same old pattern if we keep relying on our own willpower, our own wisdom, and our own intelligence. And that's the deal. You know, if you're caught in an addiction, you know, no one believes they're caught into an addiction. You have to ask your family if you're in an addiction or not. They will tell you. Now, if you tell somebody without them asking you to tell them, don't blame me if there's consequences from that. Nobody likes to be told that they have an addiction because no one believes they do have an addiction. You have to rely on your friends. Nobody knows their own breath stinks, you know. Anyway, the man in the, in the group put it like this. What is powerlessness? He said, there's power flowing into this room right now. That's how we have lights and heat, he says. There's power. But if a car was to drive into the pole between the power station and us, the power that's now flowing into this room would be disrupted. And as a result, we would be powerless. We would, we would need heat and, and, uh, uh, and light, but we would be in the dark and we would be cold. We would have no means of producing heat and light. That's what powerlessness is. It's the recognition we cannot make ourselves behave. We can't straighten ourselves out. We lack the power. Something has cut us off from the source of power, right? And the man went on to say, in the second step, we admit we need a power higher than ourselves to intervene. Now, he says, what does that mean? He said, it means we need reconnected to the source of power. Now, I can't think of a more helpful explanation of grace than that. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. That's the first and second steps right there. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. We find ourselves when we wake up to be without hope in the world. And we cry out to God, and God makes a connection and puts power back into the room. He turns on the lights. He heats up the room. But the question is, when will we turn on the switch? Well, unfortunately, we've lost a lot of spiritual knowledge in the last couple of generations. The old habits of life that used to teach us how to cooperate with God in the transformation of our lives now seem strange to us. For several decades, we've been making fun of religion, piety, sacred things, and as a result, 
A whole new generation has come of age thinking there's nothing in the church of any substance. A church is just a, a, a fun place to hang out. A church, a good church is a church that has adequate parking, good co- child care, and great programs. Well, churches better have such things because in many cases they don't have anything else. If Peter and John were church leaders today, they would say to that crippled man at the gate, all we have is silver and gold, but we will give you as much silver and gold as the church budget allows. And you know in that story, Peter and John actually had something more powerful than gold and silver to to give. They had a resource that was found nowhere else, healing for that man's body, mind, and soul. And we might need to ask ourselves if we still have that resource. There's a story about a poor bishop in the Middle Ages that went to Rome, and the Pope was showing him all the beautiful buildings and all the wonderful art, and the Pope said, well, my son, we can no longer say silver and gold have I none. And the bishop, the poor bishop said, no, your holiness, we cannot, and neither can we say such as I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Now, if the gospel is true at all, if it claims to contain something available nowhere else, a personal connection with God that results in the healing and transformation of this life as well as the never-ending life for the world to come, I want you to tell me, if we cannot deliver the goods for this life, why should anyone believe we can deliver the goods for the world to come? If the the gospel, you see, is supposed to be a show-and-tell kind of thing, if we have nothing to show the world, perhaps we ought to just stop trying to tell anyone anything. We keep trying to tell the world how to straighten up, but all if we, if we wanted the world to straighten up, we could show them what beautiful products come from a life of grace that's given to following God, and the world would beat a path to the door to find that transformative power for themselves. They can't be beat into submission to the law of God. For years, we've been saying that people become uninterested in the church and the gospel because we've become outdated and we need a facelift. Well, I don't believe it. And if, in, in fact, if it were the case, I think the only option for me would be to just simply renounce my faith altogether. I believe, the reason I believe that people become uninterested in church and the gospel is the absence of transformed lives. If Christians are as hateful as anyone else, as stingy as anyone else, as opinionate as anyone else, as unforgiving as anyone else, as uninformed as anyone else, as as self-centered as anyone else, why should we think anything we say should be compelling to the world? I think it's a crisis of saints that have eroded our influence in the world. I think we need some examples of changed lives living epistles, read and known by all. The question is, how do we get there? Well, we focus on God. We start thinking about God. You know, there's nothing wrong with most of the things we like to focus in on life. We focus on, you know, our financial lives. We should. We focus on political life. We should. We're citizens. We focus on sports, and that relieves something somewhere. That's good. <laughs> Someone told me not long ago, you know, your, 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 your sermons are just too dense. Nobody can understand them. I'm like, are you kidding me? These are the same people that can tell you what the scores were back 10, 15, 20 years in whatever game and so forth. No, it's what you're paying attention to. Well, it's what you focus on, you see. You, you got to receive the power too. You ask, ask God's power in your life. You have to admit the crud in your life. You have to admit, I've got a hateful mouth. Lord, please save me. Help me not to be hateful. I'm stingy. Lord, I don't want to give in the offering. I don't want to help anybody. I'm stingy. I'm a hoarder. Save me. Deliver me. You have to ask for help. We Rearrange our habits of thought, words, and deeds. We turn our faces and hearts to God many times a day. I'm not talking about, you know, sometimes you say that people think, oh, you know, really holy people are in a back room praying all day long. No, they're not. You know, it's prayer is a habit of just constantly turning, Lord, what would you have me to do about this? And then you, 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 throughout the day, you're asking God's, God's, uh, 
If you've, you've got business decisions to make, it's, Lord, what would you have me to do? If you've got a medical decision to make, you ask, Lord, what would you have me to do? You ask for God's help. He promises to give it. We learn to craft our lives in God for the sake of the world. But here's where it gets dicey. For many decades, we've been making fun of piety. We've nearly made the, world, the word religion into a swear word. We'd rather be caught dead than accused of being religious. We'd rather be caught being naughty than caught praying. If we're caught naughty, well, that's and I, boys will be boys. It can't be helped. If you're praying, you might be crazy. Even preachers have been running away from being characterized as pious. But unfortunately, piety is what crafts the raw product of grace into the finished product of saintly living. So what is piety? Learning the teachings of the faith, what we used to call catechism, call it whatever you want to, Bible reading, study and reflection on the law of God. That's what develops godly character and wisdom. Prayer cultivates an awareness of God's presence. Serving others turns our attention away from the toxic narcissism that gradually destroys our life. You know, that's the besetting sin of our world right now. We just, we're, we're making it like instead of uh, urging people to give their life to saintly living and we've all become a narcissist. We're self, self-centered. Everything's about us and we're taught that that's a virtue. It's not a virtue. It'll damn your soul. It'll destroy you. Your attention on yourself will kill you. Tithing and generosity is what teaches us to become stewards of our goods. If you don't tithe, you'll never learn to be generous. If you don't tithe, you won't learn to budget your stuff. If you don't, if you, if you don't tithe, it, it seems counterproductive, but if you don't tithe, you're going to be in that hole that you're in right now. You need to start. Start tithing. You're a Christian. If you, you know, you're a Christian. You want to do the stuff or you just want to come to church. You know, a parking, a, you know, a living in a garage won't make you into a car. And coming to church won't make you a Christian. Well, you got to, none of these things will ever occur until we decide they should occur and we ask God for the power to make them occur. They don't become spiritual habits until we persist in our decision to make them into habits. We keep falling down and we keep getting up all the way home. If you're on the road to God, will you fall? Absolutely. You'll stumble. You'll make a resolution and break it before you get home. Get back up again. Make it again. Stay on the road. Keep on the path. I read a blog this week that says habits are the invisible architecture of our lives. Habits are the invisible architecture of our lives. You are the product of a blueprint you have been using to construct your spiritual house. If you don't like your present spiritual house, you need a new architect. You need to ask for God's help and start cooperating with God's grace. You need to start crafting your life. Will Durant said the excellence is not an act. It's a habit. St. Thomas Aquinas says, who is that righteous man? That righteous man is that man who knowing the right thing to do does that thing day after day after day. Who is that righteous man? He is that man who knowing the right thing to do does that thing day after day to, after day. Now, if you try to follow that advice, here's what you're going to discover. You're going to meet all kinds of obstacles. You're going to discover that your will is broken. Your heart is deceitful. And your ability to perform good works is profoundly crippled. When people discover that, they're like, wow, okay, so, so I just don't try anymore, right? Wrong! <laughs> Knowing this about ourselves cultivates the most important attitude we can possibly have in our spiritual journey. Humility! God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Spiritual life is a matter of falling down and getting back up all the way home. That's why the spiritual journey begins with an admission of powerlessness. You got a habit in your life you can't overcome? Well, obviously, you're the only one in his whole church that has something like that. But now, you know, if people are serious, I, sometimes they'll come down for prayer and they'll say, you know, you know, I, I do this horrible thing. And, I, and people, the, the way that the devil does, he isolates us. 
you're the only one that has this habit, and you're the only one that lacks the willpower to break this habit. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I know you go to a lot of churches. That's what you would think. We present, you know, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Hallelujah. How are you doing? Overcoming. Praise God. How are you? Overcoming. How are you? Overcoming. It doesn't smell good. I mean, it gets deep in churches like that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, the real journey to God begins with, it's not my brother or my sister, but me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's the, the apostle Paul saying, I haven't yet obtained, but this one thing I do, I press on to the high mark that's in Christ Jesus. As you walk this journey, little by little, God's glory and grace begins to shine through you and people see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus promised us this would, would happen and if we craft our spiritual lives in a spirit of humility and gratitude, it will happen. This is the real path that leads to God and it's the real path that leads others to God. Last week, we honored 21 men who were beheaded in such a powerful service. Uh, and I wanted to give you an update on that story that we found more about as, as the uh, week progressed. There was supposed to be 20 martyrs that day. One of the men in that now famous picture, though, looks a little different than all the others, if you'll notice. He's a man with darker skin. That's because he wasn't an, Egypt, an Egyptian. We don't believe he was even a Christian. So what's the story? His name is Matthew Ayaga. Someone found that out by in our church talking to the icon painter. Ayaga. Matthew Ayaga. And he's from the nation of Ghana. Why was he beheaded along with those 20 other Coptic Christians? And more curiously, why was he declared a saint by the Coptic church? Two moving reasons for those for those questions, two moving stories behind those questions. The man had been friends of the men who were killed, and when he saw their faith in the face of death, he decided he wanted to become a Christian right on the spot. He made a profession of faith and gave his life just a little while uh, later. And what the Coptic church said this week is the early church made a decision many centuries ago during times of persecution that those who give their life for Christ before being able to receive Christian baptism are considered to have been baptized in their own blood. This man who had not been a Christian throughout his life made a profession of faith knowing full well it would lead immediately to his death. And why did he do it? It was because the quality of life he witnessed in his co-workers. In closing, I want us to think about this story for a moment. Our American churches spend enormous amounts of money doing market research to figure out where the seekers are. Think how ludicrous that is. The idea is that if we can target these identified seekers and then give them what they want, they will be inclined to come to our church. It doesn't take lots of money to find a seeker. A seeker is someone who's already seeking. You don't have to sell them anything. You have to demonstrate that we have what they are seeking. This man from Ghana decided he wanted what the Egyptians had. And he wanted it so much he was willing to profess Christian faith even at the price of his own earthly existence. What becomes obvious in the face of a testimony like this is that real evangelism is not marketing. Real evangelism is the presence of a life crafted in the ways of God that becomes compelling to those who do not know God. It connects the powerless to the source of power. When we're able to say, I once was blind, now I see. I have a testimony of what God has done in my life. As we talked about last week, Christians around the world are suffering right now, and the entire Christian world seems surrounded by so many dangerous enemies. Some of us are angry about that, too. We're really ticked off because something's been taken from us. Our power's been taken from us, and we're all 
upset about it. But what we need to recognize, it's God who is calling us back to the real stuff. God has allowed these circumstances in our lives. We've been depending on our own merits for a long time. While preaching grace, we've actually been relying on marketing, management, and performance. We've been taught actually that grace is for individuals but not for churches. Well, we're in a different place now where God's design. And brothers and sisters, it's a better place. We can't fool ourselves anymore with a fake kind of Christian smile and polished performance that hides all the crud that we didn't ever want God to deal with. Well, what God has been doing through all these trials and economic pressures and all is reminding us of Him. He's asking us to admit to our powerlessness as individuals and as congregations. But it's that very admission of powerlessness that turns on the power. God's power which is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. So I've asked the choir to conclude the service today. We've got about four more minutes in the service. went over, a little bit over. I asked them to sing the third psalm today. I love it when they do it. In times of renewal, the church, Christians always remember the first prayer book of the church, which is the psalms. And we do that because pr these prayers that are in our Bible, mold our inner selves, and lead us to take new action in the world. And they remind us there's only one source of power that can turn on our lights in the time of darkness. There's only one shield that can deflect the weapons of darkness. There's only one source of glory, one presence that's able to lift up our heads. Only God can transform trials into agents of transformation into things that craft a saved person into a holy person. That's what grace means, my friends. And the sooner you invite grace into your life and move grace to the center of your life, the sooner you will turn your face toward home and begin purposefully crafting a life that is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, as the choir sings in these final moments, I want to say to you, please, please, if you've, if you've been serving the Lord a long time, you've been coming to church, but there's, you don't see much progress in your spiritual life. You've still got bunches of stuff that you're ashamed of. You, can't, you haven't seen, to, you, you come into the church and you worship the Lord, but you, you just feel like something's missing in the connection. Why don't you determine today to get some help? There's brothers and sisters in this church right now that have walked the same path. Maybe you're further along than they in many ways. Maybe you're more learned. Maybe you're better shaped in all nine out of ten ways, but maybe they have found that one thing that they are able to say, yes, I, I had that issue and here's what I've been doing. Why don't you, you take this moment and say that humility, grace, the asking God for care, the asking brothers and sisters in, uh, in Christ for help is the thing that will turn on the lights for you and help you begin to craft your life in God. Let's listen and worship.
want to be a living epistle in your neighborhood like Pastor Dan and Pastor Greg have been telling us and join us in our Impact 100 outreach to start 100 groups for six weeks in neighborhoods. Pastor Greg will have a table in the foyer. Go talk to him today. But now may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. Lift up your countenance and give you his peace now and forever. Go in peace and serve the Lord. God bless you.